Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Inka Vat. As Hong Kong voters snub a Beijing-imposed patriots-only district election, we look at Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen's comments contrasting Hong Kong with Taiwan ahead of the country's pivotal January elections. With me to discuss this are Yan Zhengsun, National Zhengzhou University Professor of Political Science, Professor Tsai Rongxiang, National Zhongzheng University Political Science Professor and Ivy Quek, International Crisis Group Fellow. All a very warm welcome to the show today. In Hong Kong, less than 25% of the electorate cast their ballot on December 10th, beating the previous low of 30% in 1988. That's despite officials extending voting by one and a half hours. This compares to a more than 70% turnout in 2019, when opposition candidates could still stand, and in which directly elected seats stood at around 95%. That figure has been slashed to around 20% this year, following Beijing's democracy crackdown. You can see here John Lee, the territory's chief executive, casting his vote. The low voter turnout was seen as a blow to to efforts by his administration to legitimize China's vision for governance of the territory. So, for the first time, Tsai Ing-wen has addressed the opposition and Beijing's narrative about the choice between war or peace. She said recently, we want peace, everyone wants peace. Look at Hong Kong and think about Taiwan. We don't want Hong Kong-style peace, but peace with dignity. Professor Tsai, let me come to you first. So we're less than a month away from Taiwan's election. How effective do you think uh, this message about Hong Kong is this time around? Okay, uh, the message is uh, the model of one country, two systems uh, is not working at all uh, because uh, a lot of Taiwanese people, they are afraid, you know, t today's Hong Kong is tomorrow's Taiwan, okay? So the message uh, for, t for Hong Kong to send to Taiwan is, uh, if you don't have sovereignty, right, and you're going to lose your autonomy, you're going to lose your safe governance, mm. and this is this is very very bad, mm. especially for Hong Kong people, because the whole environment in Hong Kong has been changed, right? Uh, you see a lot of uh, civic organizations are clamped down, and also uh, people are afraid of. Um, maybe one day uh, the police will knock on the door and try to arrest them right away. It's a warning to Taiwanese people. We are not going to uh, follow the path of the Hong Kong's way. Okay. Professor Yen, is it still a warning as powerful as it was in 2020? I think it's irrelevant right now, especially I think both uh, the ruling party and the opposition parties, including the KMT and TPP, uh, all against one country, two system. So uh, I think the more we can do is actually to help Hong Kong people, especially uh, democracy uh, uh, advocates, that if they have uh, no place to go uh, in, Hong in Canada, United States, Australia, at least Taiwan should be a you know, place that can help to accommodate them. But so far, I haven't seen a very strong uh, active support from Taiwanese people mm. or government mm. to help Hong Kong. Ivy, so Professor mentioned there that um, KMT and PP, TPP have also mm. rejected mm. One, one China, country, two one, one country, two, two systems. Um, however, their position on the 1992 consensus is clear. So the KMT obviously follows this um, and the TPP uh, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe we should um, ask the experts, what's, what's the position of the TPP on the 1992 consensus, which is essentially that both sides, Taiwan and China, are part of one China, but there uh, is uh, uh, a difference in understanding whether that's the ROC or the PRC. Thanks, Xin. Um, so we know that for the longest time, Taiwan has looked to Hong Kong as a reference point on how the one China system uh, might work out. And as, the, uh, as you and the other two professors have said, that the one China two system is no longer accepted by Taiwanese, so much so that even KMT has seen this as a poison pill for the election, and they have also rejected it. The DPP, as you know, um, President Tsai has said that she recognized the historic the fact that the talks have occurred on 1992 consensus, but we also know that uh, her uh, 
articulation was not uh, well received by China. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, for TPP, I don't think that the candidates have uh, explicitly say, uh, expressed his stance on 1992 consensus, but he did say that he is pro-dialogue and he would like to increase the mutual understanding between Taiwan and China. Mm. Professor Tsai, yes. so, you know, um, the DPP has been uh, accused of conflating the 1992 consensus with one one country two systems. Um, however, is 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 there really that much daylight between these two concepts? Yeah, the, the thing is that for the KMT, uh, 92 consensus means uh, Taiwan, Penghu, Jinmen, Mazu uh, is part of China, and the Chinese mainland is part of China. This is what we call one China, different interpretations, but. For Chinese, for China, they say maybe Taiwan. They say Taiwan and China are part of China. Mayor Ke Wenzhe, he used to say, "I don't know the definition of 92 consensus. I have to ask President Xi Jinping." So maybe he has no stance on this. Mm. That's my interpretation. Mm. Yes, um, mm -hmm. Professor Yan. Um, let's move to um, you know the the narrative that China. Mm. Um, has 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 used when it's talking about the Chi uh, Taiwan election, and actually this is something that KMT has mm. also said, which is that the election is about war and peace. How do you interpret that narrative, given that China has made it very clear that it intends to take Taiwan? Okay, I, I just want to respond to this. I think you know, even though right now President Tsai acknowledged that 1992 consensus uh, actually took place before, but at least she need to offer something. Uh, that is saying this is their consensus between KMT and CCP. And now the DPP is in power and we will come up with a different kind of consensus for the Taiwanese people and also to negotiate with China. The onus for dialogue, at the yeah. moment the, the DPP is happy to talk yeah. to China, mm -hmm. but China is not happy to yeah. talk to so, the So the, the question here is, can, if the DPP refused to talk, you know, you gave a pretext for China to use military force, but okay, we don't have to talk to China. Uh, we are sovereign, but then we don't have to do business at all with China. And so we need, if we are really independent, uh, then we, sh we don't have to care about you know, the US or European or Japanese position and just proclaim independence. Professor Tsai, I'd like you yeah. to respond to some of the points that Professor Yan made. The current policy for the KMT is what we call a peacement policy or maybe bandwagon policy because they believe dialogue, consensus uh, can make uh, a, man, some dialogue with the, with the Chinese side. But the thing is that for China, they, they like to before negotiation, you have to accept their principle. We call it a tri uh, one China principle. It's a prerequisite, right? So if you want to uh, negotiate with them, you have to accept their preconditions. That's the thing. Mm. But we are not going to sacrifice our sovereignty mm. because they, they usually say, okay, you want to talk to us? Mm. Fine. You have to, you have to s sort of maybe you have to scale down your, uh, your sovereignty. Mm. And the thing is that you know, like a, a famous quote from Prime Minister Winston Churchill. You were given a choice between dishonor and war. Mm. You chose dishonor, you will have a war. Mm. So in, in Taiwan, uh, war and peace is, uh, is between maintaining the status quo and sabotaging the status quo. So which one is sabotaging the, the status quo? It's China, mm. not DPP, not KMT, <laughs> not TPP. That's my position, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, let's have a look at the uh, campaign slogans of each of the political parties. Um, if we can start with um, the, the ruling DPP, uh, which Professor Tsai has a copy of. This is a double made mm -hmm. de, which takes on the names of both uh, Lai Qing de as well as uh, Xiao Bi Kim, yeah. uh, Xiao Mei Qing. Yes. Um, and it emphasizes a virtuous and steady forward path. Now over to you. You know, number two is about victory, right? This is number two, it's very easy. And also, number two means peace, right? So for the DPP, they want to have peace, but they want to have peace uh, through uh, strength, through strength, not through, you know, talks, okay? So number two means a lot for this list of the candidates. Mm, so this is the military strength and the defense. Yes, and victory, okay, yes. Okay, all right. Now, uh, for the KMT, Professor Yen, Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So this, this says, we've got your back, Taiwan, 
uh, change to the new three because they are number three. They yeah, play on this. But, but this is what happening every time. Every candidate, when they you know get a number, they need to find something that rhyme uh, with this number. So three, uh, they come up with uh, a a mountain uh, means uh, something you can rely on. Mm -hmm. You know, can somehow protect you. Mm -hmm. But that's uh, their slogan. And also saying you know a three means a new shirt, new 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 basically a new outfit. So asking for maybe a, you know, alternation of parting power and saying if you vote for them, you know, and this is again uh, using the, the name of the vice president and also the first name, the last name of the presidential candidate uh, saying it, it would be good and healthy mm -hmm. uh, for you. So, so everything ho, would be ho okay. Kang. Yeah, Ho yeah. Kang. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ho mean, mm -hmm. you know, from the presidential candidate oh. come from the vice, vice presidential candidate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we should also explain that mm -hmm. um, because the letter, sorry, mm -hmm. the number three mm -hmm. also has the same sound mm -hmm. as the word for mountain yeah. in Chinese. Yeah. Okay, Ivy, let's talk about the, uh, the, the smaller opposition party, the TPP, Taiwan's People Party. Okay, so uh, for TPP, they got number one. So their slogan is uh, uh, fan gu ping yi ci, which basically means that uh, let's fight one more time by going all out. So I think that that is kind of reflecting of the TPP strategy as well because they are uh, campaigning as sort of an outsider, a third force, an alternative to the two establishment party, which is KMT and uh, T DPP. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are asking people to vote for them to fight again uh, with mm -hmm. for Taiwan. Okay, um, but central to that campaign slogan seems to be Ke Pi, Jiko Wenzhe himself. Yes. <laughs> He's the number one. <laughs> and uh, central to the DPP campaign slogan appears to be the sort of peace, yeah. um, is it honor, victory. victory. Yes. Okay, and then central to the KMT slogan is? Uh, you know, a, a group of candidates that you can rely on. Okay, Monday. so trustworthy, yeah, trustworthy. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. Okay, now my next guest is Rick Carew, and he is a visiting scholar at National Zhengzhou University's International College of Innovation. And he worked for more than a decade in Hong Kong and China. He currently advises investors about Asia's financial markets. I got his thoughts on President Tsai's comments about the Taiwan stock market doubling during her presidency. It's from more than 8,000 points when she took office in 2016, to over 17,000 today, compared with the decline of the Hong Kong Hang Seng Index. Taiwan stock market has performed really great uh, since uh, Tsai took office in 2016, and a lot of that is driven by uh, Taiwan's world-class semiconductor industry. So two of the largest companies listed in Taiwan are TSMC and MediaTek. And uh, just for data reference point, uh, TSMC over that time period has more than uh, increased more than fourfold. Conversely, in Hong Kong, the three largest components in the Hang Seng Index are HSBC, Alibaba, and Tencent, which have been hurt by the slowdown in the Chinese economy, as well as the crackdown on tech companies. The government's made a lot of uh, restrictive policies towards tech companies that have really hurt the way stock market investors value those companies' future prospects. What sort of investment is there by foreign buyers into the Hong Kong Stock Exchange? And is that level slipping? The marginal buyer tends to be international investors, given that Hong Kong is a, is a smaller, uh, smaller population. And so global investors' sentiments on, on China really uh, do hit uh, the index. And there's been a flow of money out of um, out of China markets, uh, Chinese stocks and bonds of more than $30 billion this year through October. Of course, the stock index is just one indicator that President Tsai chose to use. What do the other indicators say about how Taiwan's performing? Yeah, so Taiwan's economy has done, generally done pretty well. It's been a pretty steady growth of GDP between 2 and 3% per year, which is, looks like where we will hit for uh, 2023. And at the same time, um, inflation has been relatively mild and uh, the response to the pandemic in Taiwan really helped uh, the country to avoid uh, some of the uh, big uh, slowdowns that hit other, other markets during that time period. So I would say the economic performance uh, has been really strong during that period. Obviously, there's some concern about the future if there's a slowdown in the semiconductor industry or the uh, knock-on effects from a slowdown in China. 
And how would you compare Taiwan's economic performance with that of China's? Yeah, because of uh, the strength of the Taiwan uh, export to the West, uh, there's been some some um, additional benefits there. Whereas Western investment into China is really uh, taking a decline for the first time since uh, China joined the WTO. So we're seeing some major cracks in the Chinese economy, particularly the one I'm watching is the property sector, which uh, is having a knock on effect from slowing demand for housing, uh, leading to property developers struggling financially. And then that feeds into the financial sector where a lot of the banks uh, and investors own debt of the property companies. Talk us through some of the main indicators. Uh, you mentioned inflation, real estate, there's also consumption. How does Taiwan compare? There's affordable housing issues in Taiwan like everywhere else uh, in the world these days, it seems. But I would say because the economy uh, has really been uh, buoyed by the growth of the technology industry, as opposed to by inflating property prices, that puts Taiwan in a, in a much stronger position to have a stable outlook for its economic growth. Any thoughts about Tsai Ing-wen's presidency, her economic performance during the course of her tenure? So I think the economy has been strong. You know, the question always comes down to how much of the economic performance do you attribute to any politician or the uh, resilience and strength of the private sector? So I think it's been a combination of government policies that have been generally supportive uh, and particularly keeping strong relationships with the U.S., which is kind of the main customer uh, for for Taiwanese um, Taiwanese tech products. Uh, so that's been a good a good backdrop. But also, I would definitely think it's important to give credit to the private sector and the business people in Taiwan, which have made those contributions and built uh, world class companies here. I guess one of the burning questions is if Taiwan had closer ties with China, would it be performing better economically? Well, I think uh, growing global trade generally benefits everyone. And certainly Taiwan has benefited from outsourcing some of its lower value added uh, technology uh, to China. So for example, Foxconn uh, has been a leader in manufacturing uh, iPhones in China, and that's benefited the Taiwanese economy through uh, investment. So I think closer economic ties in general uh, are beneficial, but I think in this case, you know, the question of whether uh, closer ties to China or to the U.S. and Europe is more important. I think uh, at the end of the day, the U.S. And, and Western Europe are certainly stronger partners, as well as other, other Asian economies uh, outside of China. That was finance expert Rick Carew speaking with me earlier. The second part of China's narrative about Taiwan's election is that the election is a choice between prosperity or decline, which President Tsai also tried to address with her comparison between Taiwan and Hong Kong's stock market. So, Professor Tsai, mm. let's look at this graph, okay. which we're going to show, uh, which was trending in Taiwan a few weeks ago. It shows for the first time in 20 years, the stock, Taiwan Stock Exchange, or TAIEX, surpassing the Hong Kong Hang Seng Index. So what conclusions do you think we can draw from this crossover? Yeah, because uh, Hong Kong is part of China now, right? So uh, as I can tell, you know, the Chinese uh, economy is going down. Uh, so because China, someone says, is the second largest economy in the world, but the thing is that they face a lot of problems, like unemployment rate is very, very high and a state uh, market has got some default problem and a lot of you know, foreign uh, investment uh, in China, they are pouring out of China. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the problem uh, of China facing now. So Hong Kong got a, uh, some uh, autonomy stuff so they cannot have a liberal environment mm -hmm. for somebody uh, to do business in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, Hong Kong's uh, stock market is getting is getting down. Mm -hmm. Okay, before it was very very good, mm -hmm. right? But recent years, it's not very very good compared mm -hmm. to uh, the stock market in Taiwan. Yeah, mm -hmm. Professor um, mm -hmm. Yen. So uh, as well as um, it being reflective, the Hong mm -hmm. Kong Stock Exchange reflected of China's mm -hmm. economy, as um, Professor just said. Mm -hmm. There's also, of course, the Hong Kong protests in 2019 mm -hmm. and the, the installation the of the yeah mm -hmm. the crackdown, the, the national security yeah. law in 2020, that also mm -hmm. would have an, a negative impact on the stock yeah. market. Of course, uh, any time you show some kind of political instability, it mm -hmm. would deter investment. Mm -hmm. And you know, also Hong Kong is based on 
financing mm. uh, an international fin it's a financial center mm. but people gradually move to Singapore or even Shanghai mm. instead of Hong Kong so Taiwan has a different type of you know economic base we have manufacturing especially high tech which Hong Kong doesn't have the high tech mm. uh, you know so this is where uh, because of the demand, because of the supply chain, that Taiwan is a vital part of this. Mm -hmm. That's why I think we can continue to see our stock market climbing, mm -hmm. but Hong Kong will be stagnated because of what happened uh, since uh, you know the last few years, mm. uh, the so, process. So how convincing do you think the argument is from ch China? I mean, what are they trying to say in terms of the narrative, prosperity, or decline? I think what what they are trying to say, you know, about you know, if Taiwan, uh, you know, choose uh, not to talk, you know, negotiate with China, I think what happened is that uh, we are still, even though we we have export, you know, diverse market, but forty percent of our trade is with China, so and Hong Kong. So if Hong Kong and China both decline, we will decline. So. Uh, or, or unless we have succeeded in moving or diversify our market mm. share to well elsewhere, but so far I think in the past twenty some years, including the ruling party and also some of the business sector saying we need to you know should not be overly dependent on Chinese so market. So China saying that though, the China is saying that if you negotiate with us, if you talk to us, if you accept that there mm -hmm. is one country no i no. I, I, I don't then think they, you will they be prosperous no no no, no. no. I, I i think what they are saying is that if you choose a more radical things when we talk about status quo right now both the presidential candidate every presidential candidate talk about status quo if that status quo is not being used as a uh you know a, a excuse for pursuing other political uh, goal I think that would be fine, but this is where sometimes, you know, I think our politician, including even President Tsai, has been very uh, restrained in, in 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 not saying something to provoke China, mm. but she allowed the the net uh, citizens, netizens to continue to say some some something very negative about China. So, so what's the negative comments? Negative comments about you know the, the backwardness of China, the negative of Chinese, uh, a lot of things. Because I don't think, you know, Chai, President Tsai has been very vocal to criticize China, but mm. the you know the DPP supporters did. Mm. So if the president saying you know this is important for us to maintain a status quo by not provoking, then I think you know sh she should be able to rein in her supporters. But obviously, I think, at least from my perception, this is a you know two-hand strategy. Mm. Professor Tsai, how big a point is it that Professor is making about mm. the uh, the netizens? That's mm. number one. Number two, um, how convincing do you think? What's your reading of China's narrative, prosperity and decline, or decline? Do you agree with Professor Yan? Uh, on the one hand, they try to uh, emphasize the integration between Taiwan and China. Mm. But on the other hand, they try to use uh, Guizhong tactics mm. to inti intimidate Taiwan. So are Taiwan. they saying integration with China equals prosperity? Yeah, prosperity and okay. decline. If you you don't want to accept, uh, you know, ninety-two consensus, you know, mm. we are gonna keep pushing you guys. Right. So this is kind of like their dual policy, mm. you know, and it's it's a it's a policy about carrots and sticks, mm. right? Mm. They try to use that kind of stuff mm. to give some pressure but, but to how, Taiwanese how, people. Uh, how yeah. meaningful are the carrots now? I mean, Professor Yan um, pointed out, you know, that actually the goal in order to be prosperous is actually to diversify from China because the, their economy is going mm. down. Yeah, we are not going to put all the eggs in the, in the China basket. That's mm. the one thing. We have to go abroad. We have to do business with some other country or mm. maybe some like mighty countries, mm. not only China. China needs us too because we we export a lot of you know electronic uh, parts stuff to China. Mm. So they can ban some agricultural products but they're not gonna ban all the products from Taiwan because mm. they need us mm. as well. Mm. So that's the thing. But we can, need to can China diversify away from Taiwan? 
for those products that it imports from uh, Taiwan? Maybe some of them, right? Mm. Because they have to build their own chips because the US got a serious ban on advanced chip mm. uh, importing to uh, going to China. Mm. So, you know, this is we call internationalized mm. of Taiwan issue because, you know, it's very, very important. We need to do something. We now can, we cannot be locked down in China's single market. Mm. Ivy, so how, how convincing is the argument from China, prosperity or decline for you? Well, I, I think there's no, de there's no deny, we can't deny that Taiwan's uh, economy and China's economy are interlinked uh, and they are interdependent of each other because of the geographical proximity and because of the uh, established ties. Um, but I think that at the same time, uh, Taiwan do need to diversify uh, and even though it is hard to decouple entirely from China, mm. Ch Taiwan should at least try to de-risk uh, its economy, build mm. its uh, resilience yeah. by also uh, strengthening uh, ties with other economic mm. partners. Which, so which seems to be the general trend, isn't it, globally yes. anyway, de-risking, Professor? Yeah, but, but, but the reality, I mean, I just mentioned earlier, we have been talking about this for more than 20 years, but the percentage is still the same. Okay, we're going to have to wrap it up there. <laughs> I apologize for yeah, that. Yeah. Professor um, Yen Zhen Sun, uh, Tsai Rongxiang, yeah. and Ivy Quick, thank you so much for joining Taiwan okay. Talks today. Mm -hmm. If you liked our show, please search for us on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, and hit subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching our show today. Stay safe and see you next time.